Getting ready to buy or sell a home? Do you want to help support pro-life organizations? Then you need Real Estate for Life. Get a top-notch real estate agent and support pro-life causes. Go to realestateforlife.org to learn more. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to Jesus Love is to Christ. Love My brothers and sisters in Christ, today is the feast of the holy martyr James the Persian. And so we'd like to take a look at the Synaxarian, Lives of the Saints. And it says, the holy martyr James the Persian, a noble at the Persian court, James offered sacrifice to idols despite his being baptized. His mother and wife approached, reproached him, begging him to repent. Moved by this, he repented bitterly and returned to Christ. The king sentenced him to death by being cut to death, bit by bit, until the end. He praised God, forgave his persecutors, until they cut off his head. <clears throat> his holy head was taken to Rome, and part of his relics are venerated in Portugal, where his feast is kept on May the 22nd. The Treparian today says, You astonished everyone by enduring horrible torture with great patience, a long-suffering one, as the evil assembly performed the slaughter you uttered prayers of thanksgiving to the lord through your suffering you received your crown and went up to the throne of the heavenly king christ god O james pray to him and save to save our souls uh, then you have uh, you believed your good wife O patient guide and were awed by the dread judgment of god you despised the commands and threats of the persians of james as they cut your body as though a vine and you were revealed an honorable martyr so we hear in the life of St. James a bold witness of someone who had given into idolatry before and yet repented of it and died a martyr in the end. This is one of those unusual stories uh, that we have in our Sonic Sarian of Saints and the lives of the saints because we hear of someone who initially gave way into idolatry around the year 400. Persians. Now, for us, it's difficult to appreciate this idea of idolatry because we live in a Judeo-Christian, somewhat, uh, society uh, in, uh, in the United States. <clears throat> if you've ever visited a foreign country where foreign deities or idols had been worshipped, either in an active cult or in an inactive cult, and you see sort of the legacy of those statues and temples and so forth around, you get a sense of the power surrounding these images, these deities, these, these uh, fallen angelic powers that were worshipped by the ancient peoples. Uh, so for instance, uh, Pani and I, on a trip to Rome, uh, visited the um, uh, Hadrian's Villa. And when we were there at Hadrian's Villa, there was a place where Hadrian had actually rerouted some of the fountains, and you have these ancient statues of of ancient deities that were worshipped and you know, all these strange figures that you were looking at. But there was no active cult there, and so you had this sense that you were just looking at something that was more of a historical object. Contrast that, that was in 2002 uh, when we went to Tokyo uh, back in 2000, oh gosh, 2008, and, uh, or 2007, we went to Tokyo and we visited one of the Shinto temples uh, they're down by the Big Green Buddha. So you've probably seen pictures of the Big Green Buddha before. You can actually walk inside the Big Green Buddha. So we went, we kind of went and looked at the temple gardens. And then we went up to, to look at the shrine. And there was an active cult going on to this deity, uh, this many-headed goddess that was probably about, oh gosh, 25 feet tall. And there were people in there actually actively praying to this, uh, to this Shinto goddess in this, in this temple. <clears throat> the feeling, the sense of things were far different than when we went to go uh, to, to Rome to look at, you know, Hadrian's Villa and the little garden there with the, with the temple deities uh, that were no longer being idolized. But here you had an active cult, and you had a different sense of things about this. Of course, uh, the Shinto religion in Japanese culture, although uh, it's far more of a kind of, kind of a cultural phenomenon than anything that's actively religious, there's still something that's very much tied into uh, the, the Japanese consciousness of their identity as a people uh, and, uh, and many of the different cultural ceremonies that, and the, the weddings, for instance, the Shinto temples and the, and the going to pray and, uh, and there and, and asking for, for various gifts or good luck or whatever it happens to be. 
Uh, this is still very much a part of that particular culture. And you can imagine how, you know, here we have some Christians in Persia where there was an active cult uh, worshipping one of the gods of their pantheons. This is before the time of Islam, uh, before, uh, you know, all these, these idols were destroyed, actively destroyed. So there were these Christians that were there, likely part of uh, an early Jewish community that had been evangelized and come to believe in Christ. There were many Jews that lived in Persia. And so you have in James, a member of the court, someone who probably was pressured, felt the social pressure, well, I'm gonna go ahead and go along to get along, burn a little incense before the idols of the Persians, even though I don't believe I'm baptized, <clears throat> I'm gonna do it because it's part of the social norms. It's kind of a social expectation. And if you were to participate, in government, if you were to participate uh, in commerce even, going to the markets uh, to buy meat. This is part of the controversies that we hear sometimes in the Pauline epistles about the eating of meat offered to idols. That was a symbol of being in communion with whatever demonic power that idol represented. And so Christians would not eat of, of the markets. And in fact, uh, not even with the Jews, there were separate Jewish markets as a result of that. Uh, so you could eat kosher meat that wasn't offered to idols. You can imagine just going to the local Safeway and it's like, well, is this, is this meat, was this offered to whatever deity over here? I was like, oh, I can't have that. Well, I gotta go, you know, so, so it was an entirely different way of thinking about your whole life uh, and your social life, the social fabric. So to stand up and say, I will not bow to an idol, I will not burn incense before the idol, was really considered to be an act, uh, not only, it's not just sim simply an act of conscience, uh, it would have been an act of defiance against the social power and political structures of the time. And, uh, and so they saw in James, who had formerly burned incense before the idol, uh, he would now no longer burn incense, they saw it as a rejection also of the political power at that time, the social st structure and power at that time. Now we, of course, may not be asked to burn incense before idols, per se, but we are asked oftentimes to compromise our Christian faith and values uh, in deference to political uh, or social custom. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, very recently a bishop said that no Catholic would ever, uh, in good, or could ever in good conscience, burn incense before the idol of abortion. And, uh, you know, of course, not all Catholics even burn incense in a church, but I think we get the point, you know, it's this idea you're not going to burn incense before an idol uh, of abortion. Abortion is very much part of the social fabric of our day. Uh, you can um, uh, pretty much uh, see how, you know, it's, it's almost an expectation that abortion would be supported, and yet Catholics cannot in good conscience support this, this terrible act uh, of, of putting to death an innocent life uh, so that someone might um, maybe resolve a difficult, tense situation or, or come out ahead socially or economically. Uh, this is a human being and, and it deserves our protection uh, from the moment of conception until natural death. And so there is this sense in which we're asked to burn incense before idols. We're asked to burn incense before idols by engaging in, uh, you know, just uh, this, this rabid commercialism that we see in consumerism that calls us to idolize material things over people. Maybe we withhold charitable giving in order to buy that uh, latest uh, PlayStation game console or whatever it is that we're interested in. Maybe PlayStation's passe you now. I think they've come out with PlayStation 4, I don't know. But anyway, we're, we're looking at, <clears throat> you know, something where we give ourselves to it and, and you know, we become what we worship. We, we become the idols that we worship. It's, it's a principle in life since Earth, all the way through salvation history. You know, if we, if we uh, give ourselves over to the idols of wealth or pleasure or power or pride, we begin to resemble those characteristics. And as a result, we're no longer being made in the image of Christ. We're being in, made in the image of whatever idol we happen to be worshiping. If that's political power or wealth, it doesn't matter. And so, so, my brothers and sisters, let us look to St. James, uh, this Persian martyr who repented through the kindness and the gentle correction of his mother and his wife, uh, repented and yet 
as a result of that, suffered and willingly offered thanksgiving to God for allowing him to participate in the passion of Christ by suffering for his desire to serve the one true God. Glory to Jesus Christ.